buenas tardes a la audiencia aquí presente y buenos días o buenas noches a los que nos acompañan a distancia desde alguna otra zona horaria. En esta ocasión tengo el gusto de darles la más cordial bienvenida a la sesión titulada Valorando la naturaleza en América Latina y el Caribe, futuros desafíos y posibilidades. Good morning, afternoon or evening according to your local time. I have the pleasure to welcome you to the session named Valuing Nature in Latin America and the Caribbean, Ch Challenges and Opportunities Ahead. Esta sesión contará con tra traducción simultánea al español, inglés y portugués. Para aquellos que requieran el servicio de traducción, podrán acceder a ella descargándola a la aplicación Interactio, preferentemente desde su celular. Ustedes podrán descargarla en el link que les compartiremos en el chat de Pathable. This session will be held simultaneously will have simultaneous interpretation to English, Spanish, and Portuguese. If you need to access this service, please connect to the Interactive app, preferably through your mobile phone, on the link that appears to the chat on Pathable. A la, audien a la audiencia en línea, les agradecemos nos puedan ir dejando sus preguntas en el chat de Pathable según les vayan surgiendo. También quiero comentar que esta sesión será híbrida. Algunos de nuestros panelistas estarán presentes aquí con nosotros y otros participarán en línea. Yo soy Ana Laura Elizondo, líder de Seguridad Hídrica para Fundación FEMSA y tendré el gusto de moderar esta sesión en representación de los anfitriones de esta sesión, World Resource Institute, el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, The Nature Conservancy y Fundación FEMSA. Esta sesión, como parte del foco en las Américas, presentará los resultados del estudio sobre soluciones basadas en la naturaleza, retos y, de, y oportunidades que esperamos puedan ayudar a cerrar las brechas existentes. Para iniciar esta, in, esta interesante sesión, les quiero presentar a Todd Gardner, director de Cities for Forest y Natural Infrastructure Initiative en WRI. Please, Todd, adelante. Off some of my hair in that picture there. I'm not sure what's going on, but how's everyone doing? It's late. It's one of the last days. So I'm just going to ask everyone to quickly just stand up for five seconds, shake it out. Uh, okay, now sit down. Now sit down. We're not going to dance. You can dance. You can dance if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, a huge thanks to the facilitators of this event, the IDB, Nature Conservancy, FEMSA Foundation, and my colleagues at WRI, an honor to be here today. Um, I'm hoping that you leave this presentation with sort of three key takeaways. Um, I've heard some concern over the last few days in the hallways that even after a decade of focus on NBS for water outcomes, we're still nowhere near where we want to be. And I get that, but at the same time, we've come quite a long ways. And we've learned an amazing amount along the journey. And I think our trajectory is very much headed in the right direction. And I'm confident that in years to come, we're gonna have that many more successful case studies. So um, let's have hope and be optimistic because it really is the only way forward. The second key thing is to remember that valuation and monetization are not the same things. And we've done a lot of really good work on valuing nature. We still do have some steps to take in figuring out how to turn that into contracted cash flows and opening up a variety of blended financial sources. Third, and arguably most important, uh, I hope that you leave here remembering that today is my birthday. And some of you may have been in a session that I was in earlier today and say, well, he said that before. What's my birthday? I'm going to milk it for all that I can. And time zone, I'm eight hours behind at home. So I'm going to continue to do it when they wake up today as well. So just remember that when you're leaving your reviews. Uh, I have the great honor and privilege of directing the Cities for Forest Initiative at the World Resources Institute. Uh, we're helping cities and their local partners, whether it's utilities, local communities, understand how to engage and invest in nature in much more scalable ways. Whether that's within the four walls of their city, focused on stormwater management, 
access to green space or in those nearby watersheds trying to create better opportunities for source water protection, flood risk reduction, and the like. We work across the globe, uh, but well over 20 cities are part of our network throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. And it's some of the locations where we have the deepest and most exciting outcomes. And I feel like there's a ton of opportunities to scale and replicate, share those lessons that we can have more examples in years to come at subsequent Stockholm gatherings. There's a huge opportunity, a huge need, depending which way you look at it in terms of the water and sanitation crisis across the globe and uh, also in Latin America and the Caribbean. And as I mentioned before, we've done a lot of dialogue around the value of nature-based solutions as part of the way forward in complement to gray. It can be cheaper, there's all these co-benefits, it leads to livelihood outcomes and the like. Um, that's pretty clear, but we still aren't exactly where we need to be in terms of flagship transactions and results on the ground. And many people point to the lack of capital, right? Oh, there's no money out there to fund this stuff. And I would push back and say, there is a heck of a lot more money committed and sitting on the sidelines right now from a variety of development agencies, uh, you know, development banks like the IDB, the CAF, et cetera, uh, and, and the private sector as well. They want to be driving their money into these types of programs in a variety of different locales across the region. So limited capital, I would argue, is not the problem. If you talk to the financial institutions, they'll say, show me where the bankable pipeline is. Show me where these projects actually exist that realistically can take on a green bond and pay it back principal plus interest over time. Show me the projects that might be able to create an endowment that again, uh, has revenues that can be counted on on a monthly or annual basis. And so one of the things that we've tried to do with our partners is shine a light on what that emerging NBS pipeline actually looks like across the region. In close partnership with the IDB last year, we evaluated as comprehensive of a list as we could put together of projects that were in some level of maturity across Latin America and the Caribbean city-oriented with an infrastructure lens touching on energy, water, transport, or urban development, where NBS was a meaningful piece. We categorized where they're located, where some of the initial funding had come from, what their ambitions were, did they have a monitoring and evaluation program in place, what were the missing conditions of success. And then something really interesting is we looked at the various financing mechanisms that have been deployed, especially in the US and in Europe, um, what would it take to begin to contextualize those and drive them onto the ground across the Latin American region? And we are now working with the IDB and a lot of partners to try to put that into practice to connect the emerging pipeline with all of that capital that is currently sitting on the sideline. I think I mentioned it was my birthday. And when I was a kid, my favorite birthday gift was baseball cards. And I would get new packs of baseball cards and I would spread them out across my floor. And I would have my valuation guide. It was called the Beckett Baseball Card Valuation Guide. And I would look and I would see my Ken Griffey Jr. rookie was worth 150 and my Mark McGuire was worth 75. And when I was about 14, I paid a couple hundred bucks and I went to a baseball card show and I was going to sell my baseball cards, make some money and take a trip with my friend. And it was my first lesson that valuation and monetization are not the same thing. No one was willing to pay me that $150 that the valuation guide said it was worth. And again, I think in this NBS space, we need to transition a bit from tools focused on high level valuations where we may never be able to turn them into actual revenue streams. And I think about the report that came out about a year ago from uh, the IPBES, and it suggested that each year there was about a 10% increase in the number of NBS valuation studies that were being developed. And this was uh, across the globe. Um, 
It also noted that only about 5% of the projects that they catalog had actually been able to turn those valuation studies into some sort of financial transaction or policy integration. So again, who were we creating these valuations for? Are we clearly speaking to the utilities, the development banks, the others who have the ability to actually you know, buy these NBS outcomes and, and create these, these financial structurings? I would argue that we're not. We're creating it for too much of a general audience, which is not getting us to where we need to go. There are a lot of tools that are developing and enhancing our understanding of how you speak to those beneficiaries and those investors. And we did some work with the FEMSA Foundation, with the Nature Conservancy, uh, Sebespi, who is the water utility of, of Sao Paulo, Brazil. We looked at what is the business case uh, in that watershed of Sao Paulo, where they've had a ton of water problems, as you, as you all know. And we were able to show like, an optimization that if we prioritize investment in four to 5,000 hectares of restoration and conservation, you know, give or take year 20, we were gonna hit that sweet spot of a positive return you know, over the life of a 30 year investment, which sort of tracks with um, what the lifespan of a traditional built infrastructure looks like. Um, you know, you'll be hundreds of millions of dollars of cost savings relative to we just defaulted to gray infrastructure alone. That, that analysis is now being incorporated into a rate structure development that Sebespi is taking forward. This is a type of analysis, understanding that window of opportunity where we can drive change and institutionalize it in policy, long-term strategy and planning. You'll see here the most important thing, even if you can't read all of the, all the lines, at the bottom is grants and public money and development assistance. And as you kind of go up the chart is where you start to see more quote unquote innovative financial mechanisms, green bonds, endowments, resilience plays and the like. We need to flip this, right? We need to understand how we can create more blended finance opportunities. And we are starting to see some innovative approaches, right? Like the parametrics insurance program that was developed for coral reefs in Mexico the Forest Resilience Bond, which we've launched in California to reduce wildfire risk. Yes, that's the US, but now we're beginning to deploy it in Honduras, potentially in Peru and Chile. The green bonds market is something that the IDB and many other banks are taking quite seriously. We need to figure out how to move beyond traditional philanthropy and public dollars to really take all that money from the sideline um, and understand how we drive it into these NBS projects. If we don't, we're going to be locked into the same, you know, old way of thinking in terms of gray infrastructure, heavy climate impact, and all of our issues are going to be amplified in the decades to come. So we've gotten a little bit better at doing the analysis on the front end, right? Using tools like Invest to understand if you deploy restoration and conservation in this part of the watershed, what are the likely benefits in terms aquifer recharge, sediment control, flood risk reduction. We're getting better at modeling climate impacts under different scenarios and how that will influence the ecological outcomes that we think we can achieve. But where we've fallen even shorter, and yet where I feel really optimistic is on the monitoring and evaluation. We will never get to the scale that we need if we cannot prove with a level of certainty that the things that we're modeling out of the front end are being delivered on the back end. We will stay at the pilot scale and never get to that landscape scale watershed vision, which I think everyone in this room has. And to me, it's both ends of the spectrum in terms of monitoring, evaluation, and learning. And that learning piece is really key. So at the you know, super sophisticated high end, um, artificial intelligence and satellite imaging is making it easier now than ever before to do near real-time tracking of many of the indicators and KPIs that we care about. We can get down to the couple of meter resolution to track real land use change in near real time. We're now working with groups like Deltaris to try to do the same thing to track river levels, river flows, reservoir levels in as near time as possible. Um, that doesn't necessarily help us on some of the challenges around groundwater, right? And the issues we have monitoring there, but we've got to bring technology to bear to get better at what, uh, what's actually happening on the ground and to try to create some causality. If we see positive benefits, how much of that is because of NBS? How much of it is because of a wet year? 
And similarly, if we do platinum level NBS interventions, but are still seeing degradation, why is that? Is it because of failed regulation? Is it because of over withdrawal? Do we need to rethink the allocations? Monitoring, not just for the sake of monitoring, but to have a feedback loop to tie back into the way that we think about our strategies, our policies, our engagement with the corporate sector and the like. But we also need to understand that this takes time. You know, we can't just, you know, snap our fingers and wave the magic wand and have this data now. That also is not an excuse to not invest in it now, right? We've got to start now or we're going to be that much further behind in several years time. So this is a big area for investment to really prove out that these ecological benefits can be delivered. But it's not just the ecological side. And with NBS, I would say we've been overly focused and understandably so on what are the water outcomes? What are the GHG outcomes? How many hectares of land have been secured and conserved? Um, but the grand we probably have not paid enough attention to engagement of local communities on the front end, designing projects, um, the implementation, again, being part of the monitoring. How do we bring in local community and indigenous groups into citizen science type approaches? Um, not just to collect that data, but to bring awareness and to engage them into the process. But also who is benefiting from these projects? We've done a poor job at disaggregating our efforts to track progress over time. You know, the role of women in these projects is increasingly clear. Disadvantaged and poorer communities. Uh, informal slums, right? What happens when that may be an area that's key for riparian enhancement and restoration? What happens to those communities? These are all things that we need to be bringing together. And right now, the tools and the approaches and the diagnostics, I mean, you can Google, right? You can find them in, in a long list, of, but they're not necessarily user-friendly. We haven't done as good of a job as we could in terms of helping individual project developers in the banks, in the utilities, in the NGOs, understand which tool, which approach is fit for purpose and fit for context. So um, there's a lot of challenges. And those are the reasons why maybe we're not as far along in this journey as we would all hope to be. But each one of those challenges, there is more than a sliver of opportunity. And we are now going to hear from some of the brightest and the best across the Latin American region who have a depth of experience in developing these tools, in putting case studies on the ground, in playing around with financing mechanisms. And if we all, all work together, I'm very confident that the next time I celebrate my birthday here in Stockholm, uh, one, I might have a little bit shorter hair, and two, we'll be able to point to quite a few more successful case studies. So thank you again for the opportunity, and I can't wait for the discussion. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Todd. Esperemos así sea. Gracias por estas tan importantes reflexiones que nos compartes y nos das mucha claridad sobre los retos que enfrentamos en la región. Para profundizar más en este aspecto, contamos ahora con un panel que será presentado y moderado por Emi Oli, Research Analyst 2 en WRI. Emi, please, the floor is, is yours. She's connected by online. online. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for the introduction. And it's my pleasure to open our first panel, in which we'll hear from a diverse set of perspectives from practitioners who have been working on implementing nature-based solutions for water around Latin America and the Caribbean on some of the major challenges that they've faced in valuing and implementing nature-based solutions, and also some of the strategies that they've taken to address those challenges and overcome them. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Eduardo Ovejas. He is the operations officer for RGG Solutions Mexico, and he will be sharing with us a little bit about his work in developing a bankable model for nature-based solutions in Mexico. So Eduardo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Amy. Uh, good morning, everyone, and good afternoon or good night to those in other parts of the world. And um, feliz cumpleaños, Todd. Uh, uh, my, my name is Eduardo Vejas. I represent RG Solutions. RG Solutions Mexico is an impact venture building platform that's deploying capital across food system opportunities in Mexico. We have three business lines <clears throat> or verticals, and at the center of them are Mexican small growers. Uh, the first vertical is supply chain development, 
where we have productive land projects with small growers in Oaxaca with agave, cacao in Tabasco, and barley in Guanajuato. Uh, I will go into a further detail in this last project because it's the most relevant for today's discussion. Uh, our second line is CPG products, which are our consumer packed goods, where we create products that are high in nutrition value and tell a story of social and environmental impact. And thirdly, uh, our nonprofit, which has a social purpose to work alongside smallholder farmers and their communities to increase their quality of life. Through our known nonprofit, we seek to create blended capital effect, where we can tap into different pools of capital, such as philanthropy, patient capital, and impact investors, so that our business model represents a more attractive risk profile. For the Barley project that I mentioned, we are currently working together with the FEMSA Foundation, the Guanajuato Water Fund, NUP, and WRI. We're working to tackle the water situation in the region. Quick info on Guanajuato. Guanajuato is one of the most relevant states in Mexico in terms of agriculture. The ag sector consumes about 84% of the water. Every year, the, the reserves are overexploited by over 1,000 cubic meters, sorry. Uh, 17 out of the 20 watersheds are being overexploited every year. And because of this, of course, uh, water quality and the crops and the crop yields have been seriously affected and the situation only gets worse if we don't do an intervention. Uh, the local small growers are aware of the situation, but there's nothing they can do at, about it at the moment. Some of the challenges we have faced are land ownership in Mexico. Close to 90% of land is owned by small growers who have less than five hectares. Many of them have less than one. Current irrigation practices, which are mainly flooding, uh, this provides growers with no incentives towards uh, saving water. Water ownership rights in Mexico. Water is sown by, by the National Water Agency and it's redistributed through rights to local water districts, hence the flooding. Uh, this, per this in particular has been a huge bump in the road when trying to monetize water savings. Um, another challenge is lack of off-taking agreements for these small growers and their small volumes. Um, of course, need for financing. The ag sector and especially small growers in Mexico are seen as a huge risk for financial institutions and investors. And with no funds available, having technology or better irrigation systems, uh, the, the, the conversation is harder to, to, to have, right? Uh, and with this, it all becomes the, the chicken and the egg problem, where we know the solution is to help small growers to financing, giving them better tools and opportunities so that they can use less water, increase their yields uh, and their income. But it's not that easy, right? The good thing, uh, as Todd was mentioning, the capital markets and the world have been shifting towards nature-based solutions where water, carbon, and biodiversity can help create financial incentives that can be plugged into financial structures that reduce the risk profile and give small growers an additional source of income, creating a positive impact for water, soil, and the environment. To try and solve this chicken and the egg problem in Guanajuato, we're currently running several pilot programs that are managed by NOOP, a nonprofit that works to create tailor-made solutions for small growers. The objective of these pilots are to reduce water footprint by adding irrigation systems and man data management tools, better act practices such as crop switching, cover cropping, and regenerative agriculture, and finding the right incentives for local small growers to transition into these better act practices and technified irrigation systems. The idea is that with these small pilots, we can have proof of first scalability and can then create a sustainability bond, which is linked to water footprint reduction in which we can blend capital from corporate or public companies, philanthropy or fund foundations, patient capital, development banks uh, or agencies, and private investors. So far, the results are promising. The technology and systems placed in some of the small growers fields have provided data that, that, that gives us big amounts of water savings on each cycle. Neighboring growers have started to ask questions and have shown interest in implementing similar solutions to their fields, making this the case for scalability and a bigger positive impact. Of course, all of the parties involved, we know that these are many challenges, but all are, are considering these challenges opportunities that we hopefully we can tackle and overcome in the, in the near future and create a solution for the region, for the small growers, and then uh, probably scale it and reapply it in different parts of Latin America and the world. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for your thoughts. Um, I'm very excited to hear about the work that you're doing with your team in Guanajuato. Guanajuato. Now I'll pass it to a panelist who I believe is in the room, uh, Maria Julia Boco, a water and sanitation principal economist for the Inter-American Development Bank, who will share with us some of her experiences um, in developing and valuing nature-based solutions for water throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. So with that, Maria Julia, I'll pass it off to you. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Eh, no sé muy bien si mirar para acá o para allá es complicado. Eh, efectivamente, desde el banco, como mencionaba un poco Todd, venimos estudiando, promoviendo y financiando este tipo de soluciones desde hace bastante tiempo. Uh, y en nuestra experiencia, los desafíos que tengan que ver con la bancabilidad de estos proyectos los podemos resumir en tres de los más importantes. Hay otros, pero nos, nos concentramos en tres. El primero es la falta de datos y madurez de mercado. El segundo grupo tiene que ver con la valoración y el entendimiento de estos proyectos y estas soluciones a largo plazo. Y el tercero con los arreglos institucionales. Y lo voy a ilustrar con, con un, un ejemplo al menos o dos si tengo tiempo. Eh, en Colombia, por ejemplo, existen los que se llaman los programas de uso eficiente y ahorro del agua que todos los operadores tienen que implementar obligatoriamente orientados precisamente a la preservación de los recursos hídricos. Y uno pensaría que este tipo de soluciones basadas en la naturaleza forman una parte integral de esos programas y esos planes de inversión, pero no es el caso, ¿no? Entonces, desde hace un tiempo estamos trabajando y apoyando con, el, con, con la empresa de acueductos de Bogotá, que es quien provee el servicio de agua en la ciudad de Bogotá, más otros municipios en, en los alrededores, en la identificación y la creación de un portafolio de este tipo de proyectos. Pero ya en este proceso de identificación es cuando detectamos estos desafíos. ¿no? Entonces, volviendo a los que había mencionado antes, el de falta de datos y de un mercado. La, la literatura científica ha demostrado, y un poco como Todd lo mencionaba también desde hace rato, la, 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 la efectividad en el impacto de estos proyectos para resolver estos problemas, pero sin embargo hay una desconexión entre ese cuerpo de evidencia científico y en este caso los operadores o incluso las firmas que proveen los servicios de, de diseños y de ingeniería. ¿no? Entonces ahí hay, hay una debilidad un poco del mercado y, y una ausencia de de ofertas técnicas de productos listos para que en este caso un operador los pueda implementar. ¿no? Y un problema en parte es tal vez falta de observaciones a largo plazo que son absolutamente necesarias en este tipo de proyectos. ¿no? Eh, entonces eso por un lado. Por otro lado, también dentro de este mismo grupo de desafíos no hay una gran cantidad de proyectos exitosos que se conozcan, ¿no? casos que se puedan replicar, evaluaciones rigurosas y también que, que, que sean conocidos ampliamente por los operadores de agua. Pasando al segundo grupo de desafíos, que es el que tiene que ver con ese entendimiento y valoración de los impactos y beneficios a largo plazo de estos proyectos, la evaluación tanto técnica, que es un poco lo que mencionaba antes, como económica y financiera, para poder aprovechar la gran cantidad de recursos que existen para implementar estas soluciones, requiere de habilidades bien específicas, porque son proyectos diferentes a lo que estos operadores están acostumbrados a implementar normalmente. Y esas capacidades tan específicas normalmente no existen. Y eso también genera una barrera para la implementación, ¿no? Eh, valorar estos, estos proyectos requiere de un entendimiento que puede ser bastante complejo, incluso cuando el objetivo, como en este caso de Acueductos de Bogotá, sea preservar la calidad del agua, que a su vez le va a permitir reducir costos de tratamiento y garantizar su sostenibilidad a largo plazo, tienen co-beneficios, si es lo que mencionaba todo y lo habrán escuchado muchísimas veces en todas estas sesiones. Y el entendimiento de cómo se relacionan esos beneficios entre sí que son 
económicos, ecológicos y sociales, plantea un desafío grande. Y también entender a largo plazo cómo se comportan esos beneficios y valorados. Y el último que les mencionaba es el de los arreglos institucionales. Normalmente los reguladores o rectores aún no han incorporado masivamente las soluciones basadas en la naturaleza como alternativas reconocidas para cumplir con las normas de proveer el servicio de agua y eso también es un desafío importante porque le quita un poco de credibilidad y eleva el riesgo, la percepción de riesgo por parte de los operadores para incorporarlos. Y por supuesto que al ser soluciones que involucran a más de un actor hay que tener planes de gestión a 5, 10, 20 años que involucren a distintos actores fuera del operador y eso también siempre es bastante complejo de tener acuerdos eh, que, que tengan que ser sostenibles tan a largo plazo. ¿no? Eh, creo que el tiempo ya se me está por acabar, así que Emi, corto, corto por aquí y, y quedo atenta a cualquier pregunta. Gracias. Thank you so much, Maria Julia, for your intervention. Um, I'll start right along with uh, introducing our third panelist. Um, third, we have Jose Antonio Torre. He is the Director of Urban Planning, Sustainability, and Real Estate at Tec de Monterrey and Coordinator of the Roundtable of Metropolitan Municipalities in Nuevo León, Mexico. And he will tell us a bit about his experience in working with a diverse set of stakeholders in Nuevo León to develop urban NBS projects across that state of Mexico. So with that, Jose, I'll pass it to you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, and thank you for this invitation. Let me let me focus on the challenges uh, I, I of coordination and collaboration. And and uh, to do that, uh, let me base our our this uh, this discussion on the Monterey metropolitan area. Uh, this area where uh, five point three million people live that it's uh, the second largest metropolitan area of Me in Mexico after Mexico City. It uh, formally includes 18 municipalities, right? So you, you begin to picture the complexities. 18 municipalities uh, that range from uh, 1.5, 1.1 million inhabitants in the municipality of Monterrey to 3,000 inhabitants in the municipality of Abasolo an average population in these 18 municipalities of 3,000 people. To add on the complexity, majors of these municipalities come from five different political parties and affiliations. But these 80 municipalities have a con territorial continuum and economic and social uh, components that create bonds uh, that unite them. Uh, as you can imagine, there's also important difference in the challenges and the opportunities these 18 municipalities are facing. But, and there's also important differences in their capacities to solve them. Just to name a few of these challenges. At this moment, the Monterrey metropolitan area and the state of Nuevo Leon and all of the north part of Mexico are facing one of the most serious droughts in history lack of rain, but also the lack of leadership and capacity to act accordingly to well-crafted plans made in the past has taken the situation to its current condition. The metropolitan area of Monterrey is one of the cities with the worst air quality, with the highest concentration of PM 2.5 in Latin America. A car-centric city between 2001 and 2017 81% of investment in mobility was directed to the car infrastructure. These water and air conditions and the focus on mobility of the city are directly affecting the quality of life of the population and are also affecting the prospects of the metropolitan Monterey to become a strong and a high quality of life city for the future of the population. So there's this dire situation is, is affecting us, but also we see as a great opportunity to drive deep change. But these challenges cannot be solved by fragmented efforts or dispersed resources. A coordinated initiative by the public and private sector is required. So what, what are we doing to face these challenges? So there's an emerging mechanism for coordinating the efforts and capacities of municipalities and of the state of uh, Nuevo Leon. 
It's called in Spanish Mesa de Colaboración Metropolitana. My best English translation would be Metropolitan Collabor Collaboration Initiative. This initiative is led by the Tecnológico de Monterrey, which I represent. And it also has the participation of other local universities, La Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León, La UR, La Universidad de Monterrey, y La Escuela Libre de Derecho. So all are these universities together are providing strategic, technical, and governance capabilities to coordinate the efforts to face the common problems and harness the opportunities we're facing in the Metro Monterrey metropolitan area. Regardless the, cap the individual capacities of the 18 municipalities. So let me give you a concrete example of what has been able to achieve at least to, to, the, to date. So we have an initiative called Corredores Verdes Metropolitanos, Green Metropolitan Pathways. Complete streets that activate mobility, active mobility, access to public transportation and safe circulation for all users. Arborization of these pathways to reduce heat islands, green and gray infrastructure, and nature based solutions uh, for managing storm and rainwater that create a network of urban linear parks that provide fundamental environmental services to our cities. So, this initiative is a three year initiative with a financial commitment for the states and municipality governments for a total investment of $120 million in at least 10 municipalities for the next three years to create a network of green streets and green spaces for the city. So 26 kilometers of grid pathways, over $40 million will best us in the, in the first year of this initiative. So I invite you to follow up on this initiative and this new coordination capacity that we're creating with the help of universities. Thank you for your interest. Thank you so much, Jose Antonio, for sharing that. And it's really interesting to hear how the academic sector is getting involved in the in coordinating municipalities and supporting them in this effort. So with that, I'll pass it on to our fourth panelist, um, Carmen Yi Batista. She is a senior water and sanitation specialist at the World Bank. And she'll today be sharing us a little bit about her experiences working with a variety of water utilities in Peru on valuing and implementing nature-based solutions to improve water supply. So with that, I'll pass it off to you, Carmen. Thank you, Emmy. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, maybe I'll start before diving into the Peru study. Let me just start by providing some brief background of nature-based solutions in Peru. In 2014, the Peru Ministry of Environment actually introduced a legal framework for payment for environmental services. Within this legal framework, the National Water Regulator, SUNAS, developed an innovative regulatory structure that actually allows water utilities to invest in nature-based solutions to promote water security. And to finance this MBS solutions, the regulator required water utility to earmark about 1% of revenue from the water tariffs to be used towards source water protection activities. The Payment for Environmental Services also knows uh, in Spanish as the Mecanismo de Retribución de Servicios Ecosistémicos, or MEDESE, uh, recognizes this strong linkage between rural communities in the Andes Mountains and the urban water uses, uh, users in water scare coastal cities by actually compensating rural communities for the implementation of nature-based solutions. Within this context, it is important to highlight Lima, Peru's capital city with 10 million people located in the Pacific coast and where water mainly comes from upstream watersheds in the Andes and the Amazon. So um, this legal and regulatory framework provided water utilities with an excellent foundations to scale up MBS. And to support this implementation, national water agencies, as well as international organizations, have been actually providing technical assistance and capacity buildings to help water utilities develop a strong pipeline of MBS projects that actually are starting to be implemented in the Andes Mountains of Peru. This is all great news. Um, and as Todd will say, the money is there, the financial mechanisms are, are there in many of these programs, but there are still important challenges to scale up MBS across urban water utilities and to realize the full potential of the MEDESA mechanisms. 
Therefore, in 2021, the World Bank partnered with WRI to provide technical assistance to CEDAPAL, Lima's water utility, to basically enhance its water harvesting program or MBS program, focusing in two key areas. One was to improve this long-term community engagement. And then the second one was to strengthen the decision-making process in CEDAPAL so that nature-based solutions can be prioritized along with great infrastructure. infrastructure. With this regard, um, with regards to community engagement, uh, CEDAPAL actually reported limited participation and difficulties engaging local communities in the long term and also lack of mechanisms that would allow CEDAPAL compensate directly to communities that were not legally constituted. And several recommendations came out of this study, um, including first, the need to develop a community engagement strategy from the very beginning that, consider, that actually considers the full project cycle, including identification, design, implementation, and operation and maintenance as well as mechanisms to identify incentives that are important for the community members. Um, it is also very important that the roles, responsibilities, and commitments are clearly spelled out in a community water utility engagement agreement. Sorry. Uh, the second was to provide capacity um, building activities to strengthen community organization and to help these communities with the procedural steps so that they can be legally constituted and facilitating the compensation mechanism. And third, there's a, a need to go beyond the water utility and use a territorial approach by actually partnering with NGOs, local NGOs, tapping into river basin committees and working with local and regional governments, which are critical to leverage um, uh, over river, uh, leverages resources. And uh, with regards to improving decision-making process to advance MBS, the study actually provided recommendations to strengthen the existing planning process with the application of cost benefits analysis using a step-by-step -step tool developed by WRI called the Green Grade Assessment. Basically, with the assessment, uh, the aim is to create a building case for, N for MBS by quantifying project benefits and also its co-benefits by identifying capital and O&M costs, modeling expected results with tools such as INVEST, and considering risk and uncertainties in the application of financial and economic analysis. So just to conclude, we believe that these recommendations related to community engagement and tools to improve decision-making within the water utility can really make an impact in scaling up MBS in water utilities. Thank you, Emmy. Thank you so much, Carmen. And it was really interesting to hear there also to hear about um, your engagements with local communities and their role in valuing MBS. So with that, I think we'll start our question and answer session for this session. Um, we've had a, one question come through on Pathable and I encourage uh, users or listeners that are online to submit more there. And then also we can open it up to questions from uh, listeners in the room. So our first question comes from Pathable. And this is for Eduardo. Um, and the question is, how do you present or prevent the issue of leakage of philanthropy money to the more savvy investors. This comes from Peter Penning on Pathable. Uh, great question. Uh, the way we are trying to integrate that into our model is precisely by having our nonprofit. Uh, with our nonprofit arm, what we want to do is uh, our nonprofit has a specific social uh, purpose, and with that specific social purpose, uh, our nonprofit can apply for, to grants that are specially dedicated to towards small grower farmers in Mexico and their communities and the, the specific needs that they have. And through those grants, we can only use uh, that money for the specific purpose. Uh, another thing is in Mexico, it is really hard to, well, I, I think in, in many parts of the world, but it's really hard to have a, a nonprofit and maintain that nonprofit status. You have to uh, comply with different uh, regulation things and, and, and be really specific on the, the use of proceeds and all of that. So how we're trying to, to integrate that is 
uh, with our nonprofit, we 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 apply to grants or philanthropy uh, money that can be placed to that part of the of the model, and then with the different uh, things we're doing in field with the small growers, then we become a productive type of project where uh, regular types of capital go into that, and then uh, a regular returns, uh, or maybe not high returns, but regular returns in terms of market value can come from that part of the of the of the model. But the, the initial part where the diagnosis and the work with the small growers do not interfere in that part. And that way uh, we can have a less risk profile and use that money for the specific needs of the small growers, the communities, and the social impact we're working on there. Hope that uh, answers the question a bit. Great, that is um, good to hear from you. So with that, um, if there are people who have questions in the room, Perhaps Giovanna, um, who is in the room, has offered to help moderate those questions. But in the meantime, you can raise your hand and let Giovanna know that you have a question. Um, we can queue up a list of questions there, and I'll ask, uh, go on with asking uh, the panelists a few other questions. So Maria Julia, um, a question that we have for you is, drawing on IDB's experience with implementing nature-based solutions across LAC, um, what do you think is needed in the 10 or so years ahead to help overcome the types of valuation challenges that you addressed in your intervention. Un poco a lo que decía al inicio, la falta de datos. Entonces, posiblemente un, un, un tema clave sea Continuamos. <laughs> un tema clave sea desde el principio de la implementación de estos proyectos poner en in place un arreglo de monitoreo que permita ir midiendo los beneficios en términos de para, para hablar en términos de evaluación, midiendo los beneficios a lo largo del tiempo para al cierre del proyecto poder hacer una evaluación ex post robusta y que permita nuevamente contar con proyectos que puedan ser modelos irreplicables eh, en, otros, en otros contextos y, y, y con otras agencias. ¿no? Eh, y, y esto no tiene que ver necesariamente con medir, pero obviamente que los arreglos institucionales y financieros, sobre todo, ¿no? todo lo que tenga que ver con pagos de servicios ambientales es absolutamente crítico para que esos beneficios se materialicen y puedan ser eh, sostenibles en el tiempo. ¿no? Creo que esos son temas eh, sumamente importantes. Thank you, Maria Julia. Um, Jose, for you, um, one question that we had was, in your experience working to coordinate the Distrito Verde project, or the Corredores Verdes project, what are the remaining political and institutional challenges that need to be addressed in order to unlock increased investment in NBS and scale the project? Yeah, thank you, Emmy. Uh, with, I mean, we're very focused on design and, and, and execution right now. So I, I think one of the, the lacking and the challenges is if, if one of monitoring and evaluation. So, um, so harnessing capacities for that and maybe an external and third party or this university consortium that can really get the KPIs, the data, the value created through these investments and efforts. And then through that, attract other funds. I mean, this this is this should be a long-term project and long-term initiative. So right now, monitoring and evaluation to understand the impacts and the benefits would be the main challenge. Thanks so much for sharing that. I think that's something that rings true and that also was highlighted very much in Todd's note, um, keynote uh, for many projects in Latin America. Finally, um, we have one more question for Carmen before we can open it up to the audience. Um, so Carmen, having worked with a variety of water utilities in Peru on investing for in nature-based solutions, um, and more broadly with the World Bank on water supply projects across the region, what do you think are the biggest challenges in the year ahead to mainstream nature-based solutions and in, in utilities investments across for water supply across the region? Gracias, Emi. Um, 
Quería un poco reforzar lo que estaba mencionando la colega de, del BID, de, definitivamente el tema de eh, monitoreo y de identificar resultados va a ser sumamente importante, no solamente al final de los proyectos, pero durante los proyectos, ¿no? especialmente cuando tenemos que eh, mejorar digamos, esa evidencia para eh, justificar estos proyectos de Nature Based Solutions. El otro tema que, que veo importante es la la apropiación de soluciones basadas en la naturaleza dentro de las empresas, dentro de los water utilities, ¿no? Y lo digo porque usualmente lo que estamos viendo es como la, la unidad de proyectos ecosistémicos, ¿no? O el departamento específico que está trabajando en proyectos específicos, eh, de proyectos eh, ecosistémicos. Y no tanto como la integración de estos proyectos en toda la empresa, ¿no? Yo creo que eso es sumamente importante porque hay mucha capacidad en la empresa con respecto a temas ambientales, temas sociales, trabajos con la comunidad, proyectos, eh, eh, desarrollo de planificación de proyectos y implementación de proyectos. Y eh, que, creo que tenemos que ir más allá de la empresa en la integración de todos los departamentos como un todo. El tercer punto... Eh, que considero también importante es a lo mejor flexibilizar, digamos, ciertos procesos, digamos, permisos, eh, este, eh, eh, digamos, como procesos o regulaciones relacionados a la inversión pública, ¿no? Porque muchos están orientados más que todo a infraestructura, a la infraestructura civil, que es mucho más rígida que estos sistemas de proyectos ecosistémicos. Entonces, en la medida que podamos flexibilizar para poderle dar a estos proyectos ecosistémicos el espacio que necesitan para hacer su trabajo, creo que eso sería algo que tendríamos que considerar. Gracias. Thank you, Carmen. With that, I'd like to give the in-person audience one more chance to ask a question. I think we have time for one more question from the audience for our panelists. And I can't, I don't have an audience view now, but if there are no other questions, I will pass it back to Ana Laura to- Okay, oh. I'm not... Oh, there is one question. No. ¿Se escucha? Sí. Okay. Great. Um, esta pregunta es para, toda la para todos los panelistas y sería, escuchamos un poco de las barreras que hay. En, ¿Nos pueden contar de las oportunidades o sea, dónde creen en sus diferentes sectores que podría venir eh, esas grandes oportunidades o, o a dónde tenemos que apostar hacia futuro? No sé si alguien la quiere responder. Gracias por la pregunta. Uh, I guess it, it, in terms of what we're seeing, and it goes back to how Todd started, uh, there's a lot of money that is now standing in the sidelines. And I think what we're seeing, uh, there's huge uh, cost for technology. Uh, and as technology becomes cheaper or there's more money available to implement those technologies in the field and in small growers to provide these nature-based solutions, I think that's uh, what's going to be a great um, way to challenge, uh, to, to, or opportunity to tackle those challenges, I mean, uh, and then uh, do transition finance. Uh, it, it has to be patient capital that is deployed towards these types of solutions uh, that we can work together and then scale. And like I said, uh, try to eliminate that, that, that problem of the chicken and the egg, what comes first, and, and maybe start adding some risk to the portfolios or, or, or deploying that money towards more risk so that the, the programs can be proven and scaled and applied in different parts of Latin America and the world. Hi, uh, Amy. Yeah, I can add, and thank you, Carlos, for, for the question. Um, I can add that in, in, in the case of Monterey, what we're trying to achieve is this kind of proof of concept that working together and coordinating efforts with the state uh, government, municipalities, universities, uh, we can create important impacts for, for the city uh, and for the environment. And so the, the, the opportunity is, is we need to be successful, right? And, and that I think will enhance the willingness to collaborate and at hopefully if we measure right, if we wanted to right, uh, attract private and international investment and more public investment in this type of effort. So we think that uh, it's important to be successful, to measure 
the value created and then replicate this initiative uh, all over uh, the city and, and hopefully in other places. Thank you, Jose. Um, I think we are at time for this Q&A section and we need to begin to move on to the second session. So with that, I'll pass it back to Ana Laura. Thank you so much, Emi. Ahora, quiero presentarles a Carlos Hurtado, gerente de Seguridad Hídrica y Desarrollo Sostenible en Fundación FEMSA, quien moderará y presentará nuestro siguiente panel de expertos. Adelante, Carlos. Gracias, Ana. Eh, después del primer panel donde platicamos mucho de lo que son los retos, eh, ahorita tenemos un panel de lujo para platicar de qué estamos viendo hacia adelante y de algunas de las oportunidades. Este, nos está acompañando eh, Alexandra Bruce, candidata de doctora y asistente de investigación del grupo de hidrosistemas de, Univers de Universidad de Massachusetts. Laura Ballesteros, secretaria de Desarrollo Urbano Sostenible del municipio de Monterrey, Nuevo León, en México. Cari Biggerson, directora de Ciencia en Seguridad Hídrica e Innovación de The Nature Conservancy. Y Mauricio Scrusher, especialista de geociencia de 52 Impact. Eh, aquí nos van a platicar un poco de lo que hemos escuchado como barreras ahora, oportunidades de las herramientas que están pasando en el campo y de algunos de los eh, elementos que tendremos para hacer frente a, a los grandes retos. Eh, si podemos empezar eh, con Alexandra, que nos platique un poco acerca de lo que está haciendo Yumas y, y del trabajo tan interesante que tiene. Hi, uh, thank you so much. I'm super sad not to be there with you all in person for World War II week. Uh, returning in person. Um, as Carlos already said, uh, my name is Alexa Bruce. I'm a researcher at the University of Massachusetts. Really interesting panel discussion so far. And for me, in terms of solutions, there, there sort of is a common thread that I think can play a large part in unlocking many of the barriers that, that have been highlighted um, already. Um, so in the hydro systems research group that, that I am a part of, which is led by Casey Brown at, at the University of Massachusetts, We've seen time and again in the places that we've worked in Mexico City, in Tanzania, with the World Bank, in San Francisco with the Public, Utility, Public Utilities Commission there, in the Upper Rio Grande in New Mexico with WWF, and in the example I'll share today where we've been working with the FEMSA Foundation and with the Water Fund, Casi Bajillo, there in the, for the state of, of Guanajuato, Mexico. And that is, you know, the power that data and scientific analyses can have in unlocking political deadlock and bringing together a fragmented water sector. And we heard a bit about, about that already. Um, and really sort of toward a common vision, right? And in the case of Guanajuato, we built um, an integrated and dynamic modeling framework that includes the simulation of climate, surface water hydrology, groundwater, municipal and industrial consumption and agricultural production. And, you know, it's a modeling framework that allows us to understand the interconnected impacts of different investment options across industries and on different parts of the water cycle. And critically, like, you know, we've already heard today the, the importance of, of a participatory approach, and that's how we conduct all of the analyses and build all the models that, that, that we in the work that we do. Um, and by, by doing so in a participatory manner, working closely with colleagues in key institutions in, in Guanajuato to generate and process data sets, which is a, a, perhaps a, it's not just about modeling results, but also about the input data that goes into those models. Um, and uh, sort of iteratively develop these models based on local preferences and priorities. And, You know, these models facilitate planning, planning processes that in, in our view and in my view are essential to ensuring that good decisions can be made. You know, they provide a common truth that diverse stakeholders can point to and have trust in. And what we've seen, you know, can really act as a neutral broker in, in what is always a highly political conversation. Um, I don't know if you can see slides on the screen. I can't really see, but um, <laughs> if you can. Um, I, there's a figure in the second slide, um, but if not, I'll just describe it. <laughs> so what I show here is in essence, a very sort of simple figure. And that is the, 
the rate of groundwater depletion across the state of Guanajuato as simulated by our groundwater model, which was developed by colleagues at the University of Guanajuato for this project. Um, and, you know, the serious issue of groundwater depletion is not a new um, revelation. It's well known in Guanajuato, but the ability to clearly bring everyone around the table to see for themselves the extent and the decline, the speed of that decline. Um, you know, in many key urban areas, the water table is declining by three to eight meters per year, which obviously has serious social and environmental consequences. And, you know, seeing those figures and that data in an easily comprehensible way for everyone and all, all um, stakeholders has, has really been able to generate the political will and, and traction necessary to take action. And what I would say is that, you know, we really must be able to include these nature-based solutions alongside their great counterparts in, in these modeling processes, in these modeling frameworks, and as part of the investment planning and preparation um, for projects. Um, in terms of model implementation, this is a straightforward task. We can do this. We know how to do it. Um, and we have done so in, in certain places in Mexico City. We did, we did so, um, uh, and in other examples as well. Um, as long as the evidence base is there, right, to support it. And that's something we've heard time and again already today, um, that we need sort of the monitoring, monitoring and evaluation in place to provide that evidence base. Um, you know, there are lots of excellent examples to point to, but we do still lack that sort of comprehensive um, evidence base to, to allow us to include it in this, alongside a kind of portfolio of investments that, that we want to evaluate um, when we do these studies. Um, and, you know, without the ability to rig rigorously evaluate these, the performance of these solutions as part of that portfolio of investments, they will be lost right at the beginning of these planning processes and, you know, continue to be an afterthought or an add on sort of uh, sort of distinct opportunity apart from sort of the more broad planning processes for water security in a place um, and and really a barrier to becoming a central part of the solution to be implemented at scale. So those are my two cents. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Alexa. Este, ahora eh, quisiéramos escuchar un poco de, del municipio de Monterrey con la secretaria Laura Ballesteros. Eh, está, el municipio ahorita está trabajando mucho y siendo pionero en, en todo el tema ambiental. Eh, entonces, Laura. Hola a todos. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with you and especially, well, I, my, 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 my apologize for not being there uh by presence but you know the the government of monterrey is working very hard as carlos said in, in nature-based solutions and builder nature solutions for our city and especially based on the climate emergency that we are living right now so i would like to start uh, from there, um, a couple of months ago in the COP26, the Mayor Colosio declared a climate emergency for Monterrey, uh, having in mind that it is a very important thing to do to um, uh, uh, sustain the responsibility of the government on this. And if we can't name it by its name that we are living in a climate emergency, we're not going to be able to create any kind of solution. So we are ready to start from there since then. And the answer for that climate emergency declaration is the Green New Deal for, for Monterrey. So for us, it is very important to uh, uh, maintain inside this Green New Deal, the actions, the solution, and actually the planning that we, an investment that we are going to uh, create to solve a lot of the problems that we have already. As you may know, the government of Monterrey as a local government will um, only um, long for three years. So we don't have any time to, to waste. And that is the reason why uh, with this instrument of particip participatory governance for climate action, uh, we are going to create a roadmap for uh, uh, create three main objectives. You have here a slide. I'm going to explain this 
also by myself. Uh, what we are trying to create here, the main three objectives of the Green New Deal from, from of Monterrey is to connect and share climate change knowledge with citizens, uh, create a collective um, route to decarbonization. We also, uh, we are part of the Race to Zero initiative. We, we were the, the first uh, Mexican city that signed in in this initiative uh, through concrete intersectional collaboration and commitment. And the third objective is to develop climate solutions and implement them through the creation of the climate action plan and the municipal climate change regulation. For us, it's very important to uh, sustain the action uh, through regulation and through investment. But in order to get there, it is very important to open the dialogue with the people. And, and, and we need to understand that they are the ones who need to be involved in. We are not going to create these climate solutions only because we want to. And the, 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 the environmental right, it is a right for everybody. And it is also the obligation of the government to be part of process. So we are very aware that we need to share information and evidence with everybody and to keep open the conversation and it is part of the main objectives. So through these interventions, because this is not in or this open it is also a matter of public policy and specific actions and investments in the street. I mean, in the territory, because it is it is a place that we need to create the, the change in our city. So uh, in this holistic plan for Monterrey City, uh, we are considering four pillars, which in turn uh, contemplate the specific projects and interventions. The four of them are parks and green corridors system. This is one of our main projects in Monterrey. We are going to create this huge system of uh, that it is uh, in, that includes parks and also green corridors with complete street uh, in, in this concept of uh, sustainable mobility, but of course with um, extreme uh, reforestation because for us it is very important to bring trees in Monterrey. Uh, so parks and green corridor systems with 19 parks uh, um, and 73 kilometers of green corridors. These projects are expected to add more than 10,000 new trees, with means, um, which means the absorption of more than 500 tons of um, uh, CO2 per year. So for us, this is a main part of what we are trying to do in this Bailey on uh, in our city. We also have our program of extreme reforestation seeks to increase the number of trees within the urban layout and consolidate the forest heritage of Monterrey. Our goal is 50,000 um, trees in, in three years for our city. It is important to understand that in the north part of the city, the, we have nine times less the, the green uh, area that it is recommended per cat, per person, that, that it is recommended uh, in the, of the, we, we, um, by the WHO. So, so for us, it is very important to create these green spaces for the city. And we also have the Arroyo Seco project that it is part of the, of, of the work of the Tec de Monterrey and Jose Antonio Torre, who is represented them here, can uh, talk about this a little bit more. But we have uh, there six, six kilometers of site remediation. And for us, this part of, of the way water uh, uh, management, it is very important also. And at least, at, at last but not at least, the urban development and buildings for us is very important to attend from this value nature solutions. So we're building the regulation for sustainable energy, energy efficiency, new buildings for the new buildings, including uh, the optimal use for natural resources. I mean, water, land, air, sun, um, rainwater harvesting programs also for the most vulnerable neighborhoods in Monterrey and public schools that have suffered the consequences of the water crisis. As you may know, we are living the most dangerous and uh, an historical water crisis in our city and in our state. So it is very important to add for uh, all our actions how we can capture the rainwater in, all, in order to uh, create this uh, uh, solution for the people who are suffering right now with this. Um, this program for adaptation and mitigation of climate crisis effects in which rainwater harvesting systems are installed in residential units and public schools with water shortages, uh, providing resilient infrastructure to encourage water reserves uh, that reflect on improving the lives of hundreds of people and procuring the health of the children. Our first private program will, will include a hundred of systems for a hundred homes here in Monterey City. 
And we're going to have this ready, this pilot program at the end of September. Um, and municipal irrigation strategy, including only great water, treated water for parks and green areas. Also in, in order to have this management of water for our green spaces, but also to uh, procure the, 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 the water for humans, for, for, for the use for, for our for the homes and the houses. So in conclusion, we are um, working a lot, helping to build resilient, a resilient city. And these programs such as Barrios de Lluvia and Escuelas de Lluvia and our green corridor system uh, will focus on water and biodiversity. And it is helping us to provide, to preserve, manage, and restore natural ecosystems in a cost-effective manner. Muchas gracias, Laura. Y ahora para platicarnos un poco de, del tema y de la apuesta que tiene TNC en, en temas de ciencia, Cari, eh, TNC ha sido un pionero eh, en temas de ciencia, en temas de Nature Based Solutions, y nos va a platicar un poco de las apuestas que tienen hacia futuro. Thank you so much, Carlos. And hello to everybody in Stockholm. I hope you're having a great week. Sorry, I can't be there. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk about an online platform that is aimed at addressing some of the barriers mentioned by our speakers today, especially the challenge of assessing the financial feasibility of nature-based solutions to address water security issues. So my colleagues at the Nature Conservancy and our partners were finding ourselves spending upwards of $50,000 and putting in several months of work just to answer that question of whether um, nature-based solutions could offer cost-effective solution to water challenges in a given watershed in a scientifically credible way. So this obviously slows down the process of nature-based solution watershed program development, and it also makes it hard to engage with partners and funders. So we thought if we could find a way to more quickly and more transparently demonstrate a positive return on investment, we could both move these projects forward more quickly with less funding up front and increase investment in these types of programs. So with this in mind, myself and a number of my colleagues, especially from our Columbia team, worked on this for the last few years, including developing prototypes and testing those with key users. And in December of last year, we launched this online platform called Waterproof. So the intention of Waterproof is to provide a rapid, high level ROI assessment uh, to provide stakeholders interested in nature-based solutions for water with a pre-feasibility assessment regarding that nature-based solution potential. So what's great is even though we just developed this for our own purpose and, and working with our partners, we really want this to be something that everyone can use. So it's free and open source so others can take what we've done and build on it. And it's available to any user anywhere in the world to do this rapid assessment of return on investment for nature-based solution portfolio. Next slide, please. So the main concept of the platform is to combine the best available global biophysical data sets with virtualization of ecosystem service models. And you can just click through those, thanks. And with information on water treatment systems specific to different countries and cost benefit analysis using peer reviewed cost functions. So if the user has localized data sets, they can improve on these default values, including customizing the water treatment system, adjusting the cost functions, selecting specific nature-based solutions, and selecting which climate change scenarios they want to integrate into the modeling. The outputs of this platform include biophysical outputs such as water yield, sediment delivery, and carbon sequestration, financial outputs such as the overall return on investment or cost benefit over time, and geospatial results such as a map of where the NBS portfolio is located across the watershed. And these different results help the user determine whether nature-based solutions is something that can work in their water basin. Is there a positive return on investment for addressing the specific water security issues and show an indication of what that appropriate portfolio might look like across the watershed. So since we launched the platform late last year, we've really been focusing on applying the platform or applying the, the modeling tool to a number of cases around the world. So there are specific cases that are uploaded into the platform so that if you go onto the platform and want to see examples of, um, of this being applied in different places um, across Latin America and other places around the world, um, you can do that and more will come in the coming months. 
And right now the team has um, some time allocated to work directly with users on applying the platform in their watershed. So if anybody's interested, uh, feel free to get in touch with us and, and we can um, make that happen. So obviously we've heard a lot about different challenges today and we know that waterproof isn't gonna solve all of those challenges, even the ones related to the financial analysis of nature-based solutions. Um, but we think that it can offer a great start and um, we plan to continue to build on the current version. We wanna be able to model a wider variety of water security challenges and to add features that are most useful to key users. So as you get into the platform, um, we're definitely welcome feedback and we're really interested in any um, anyone who's who wants to talk about maybe collaborating going forward. So um, just to wrap up, we think this platform has a potential to serve as a powerful tool for prioritizing locations for nature-based solutions for water and engaging partners and funders of nature-based solutions for water security. So um, we think this is critical for more rapidly and effectively scaling nature-based solutions for water. And of course, um, ultimately delivering what we're most interested in, which is water security benefits for both people and for nature. So thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Cari. Eh, ahora para platicar también en la parte de tecnología eh, de las apuestas y de algunos de los caminos que tenemos para eh, hacer un monitoreo a escala y más barato, está con nosotros Mauricio. Si quieres pasar eh, para platicarnos de las apuestas y, y del trabajo que está haciendo 52 Impact eh, en este tema. Gracias, Dan. Es, uh, ok. Bueno, right, tenemos un slide aquí. Yeah. Sorry. I have it. All right. Just flip upside down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, perfect. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Maurits Kruiser, and I'm uh, very happy to, to be standing here uh, presenting at the World Water Week. Uh, representing 52 Impact. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, a specific opportunity that we can use to uh, overcome some of the technological barriers uh, that we face when implementing nature-based solutions. Uh, and specifically, I want to talk about the important role of spatial data and satellite data and how spatial data and satellite data can be used to, first of all, better understand the water challenges that we face today around the world. Uh, and secondly, also specifically, how can we use spatial data and satellite data to maximize the impact of nature-based solutions? Um, and I would like to do that by uh, basically guiding you to one specific use case uh, that you see here on this presentation slide. Uh, but also note that with, of course, some minor adjustments, uh, this approach can really work as a sort of a, a blueprint uh, of maximizing the impact of nature-based solutions uh, in different parts of Latin America and also different parts of the world. So with that said, uh, I would like you to take you through this uh, this use case. So this is a project that we did for a client of ours, uh, which has a, a which is a large water consumer uh, and has a production site uh, uh, located in the Rio Conchas watershed in the northern central part of Mexico. Um, and uh, this is a water stressed region. And one of the first things that spatial data comes in very uh, handy is understanding the water challenges in a certain area. So understanding the context. And that is what you see on the top left part of the presentation. What you clearly see is that what you see there is groundwater levels and how they're declining over the last decades. And you can clearly see that they are declining and also that the rate of uh, depletion is, is increasing uh, over, the, over the last years. And in the last 10 years or so, groundwater levels are being declining by more than two meters. So that's a big problem. Uh, for the for the entire region, for the watershed, but also, of course, for this production site. So the question is then, what can we do to improve the situation? So uh, yeah, what we did then is some exploratory analysis to see right what kind of implementations uh, um, uh, can be used there. And out of the analysis came forward that nature-based solutions uh, can play an important role in improving the situation, so improving the, the water availability in the in the groundwater. Of course, not just solving the problem, but definitely have an important impact on improving the situation. Um, so for that, spatial data, again, uh, can play a very important role. 
basically um, um, by uh, doing two things. First of all, we can use spatial data and satellite data uh, to find the best locations uh, to, uh, to implement nature-based solutions. And this is basically finding the locations where most of the water that is normally lost to runoff can be retained uh, and therefore percolate into the soil and uh, lead to groundwater recharge. So this is actually something we can calculate and based on that, find the best locations. And secondly, what is also important is that we find locations where, let's say the lifespan of the vegetation that is being planted uh, can be secured or at least uh, maximized. So that these plants don't die within the first three years, for instance. Um, so based on that analysis, where we use different spatial data sets for, which I, I will happily explain uh, after the session, uh, we can then select the most suitable locations for implementing nature-based solutions, which you see here, which are the yellow areas uh, with the circles around it. So in total, 4,000 hectares. And these are then really the locations where the impact uh, is the highest. So the most water uh, can be uh, uh, recharged into the aquifer. And this is really something that we can already do today and something that we can even do before the actual implementation to find uh, the places where the, the impact is maximized. And of course, then also in the phase after the implementation, which is also something uh, taught, taught about and something that's very important, also make sure that the impact uh, um, and the effect can be, can be monitored, can be secured also after the implementation and to really evaluate the, the, the impact basically uh, using satellite uh, monitoring. So yeah, just to conclude, uh, spatial data is very important. Uh, first of all, to uh, understand really the water challenge that we face uh, in, a, in a certain area. And then also before the implementation, see what is the best solution that we can do. And then afterwards also to really make sure that this impact is being met, which I think very important. So uh, thank you. Gracias, Mauricio. Uh, ahora, eh, no sé, primero vamos a empezar con qué preguntas en la audiencia. Es, ¿Alguna pregunta de la audiencia? Y si no, de mientras empezamos con una de que tenemos en línea. Eh, y esta es para Cari. Eh, the question is a little bit long. So, do you evaluate your MBA's projects to learn from your mistakes and failures? What have been your major learning points and have those, learn, have those learnings been fed into Waterproof? Great question. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, and especially the, the theme that we're hearing from a lot of um, speakers today around the monitoring evaluation and the importance of, um, of focusing on this to make sure that we're having the impact we want to have and then which can then also feed back into um, learning how to be more effective implementing nature-based solutions and um, bring in more investment to nature-based solutions in the future. So yes, to answer your question, we do monitor the results of our projects. So both um, implementation monitoring and um, impact monitoring. And um, we, you know, some of the things, and, and you are able to take, we can take those results and put them back into the modeling. So for example, a um, couple of our water funds, um, and not inside Latin America, but um, in um, Cape Town, we have a really robust, um, uh, we have a really robust sort of uh, um, dashboard, sorry, where we're keeping all of our information about, uh, where we make it really transparent about the implementation and the results. And we're able to feed that right back into the models that were used to do the business case. And so we're taking um, that example and bringing that um, again back to Latin America. And um, I think it's really important to, to take that information and, and reassess um, and adaptively manage um, you know, the project based on what we're finding. So yes, the intention is, we just launched, as I mentioned, Waterproof in December, but I think the intention would be to be able to um, look at, you know, our initial business case or return on investment and um, take the information that we're constantly getting and um, make adaptive management decisions. Um, in terms of what we've learned the most, I think, um, you know, I think uh, that one of the things that others here will probably agree is that even if implementation can happen um, at a at a rapid rate, um, with you know water resources so complex and hydrology that um, it takes a long time to see those impacts that we're looking for, and so it's really important that we have this sort of um, um, short term, medium term, and long term types of um, outcomes that we're tracking and that we um, are able to um, 
uh, see some some early results of you know more localized impacts, but that impact at scale at the whole watershed takes um, uh, you know a number of years to see that impact. And so um, I think that's really important as we're communicating about projects and thinking about how we carry those projects forward over um, a number of years. If not, um, I would like to know if you could talk a little bit about in each of your fields, uh, where would you think the biggest opportunities are coming from? Where do you think the biggest best should be placed uh, to reach the scale that we need for MBS to really be uh, the viable alternative that we think it can be. So um, I, I know that you come from a technology angle, most of you. So um, I don't know who wants to be the first step. Uh, Alexa? Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so I think uh, monitoring and evaluation certainly seems to be the thing that has come up um, the most uh, in the conversations today. and. You know, we do need quantified and measured impact data from these projects that have been implemented to sort of generate that confidence and trust. And, you know, the challenge is that monitoring impact in the traditional sense, implementing ground instrumentation, et cetera, is generally prohibitively expensive, which is, I guess, why we um, haven't seen as much of it as, as we would like. Um, but we do have technology solutions and, and we had about 52 impact working on some of those as well just now, um, which can enable us to sort of overcome this challenge. Um, we're also working on using remotely sensed data and combining that with machine learning based hydrological models that, that enable us to sort of me measure and verify impact um, of investments in a, in a robust and critically sort of scalable way um, at low cost. And, you know, not only does this enable us to sort of, I guess, build the case for nature-based solutions as part of a business as usual solution set, um, but I think it also unlocks a world of potential in terms of financing mechanisms, right, to pay for these solutions and move away from some of the reliance on grant funding that, that the WRI report highlighted and Todd was talking about earlier. Um, you know, for example, via the ownership economy, the prospect, this is the prospect that you know, anyone could invest in and own a stake of that authenticated observed impact in a specific place. Um, and there's a huge amount of opportunity there. And, you know, IDB just had a call for biodiversity, digital tokens for biodiversity. So, you know, I think there's a sort of also a general recognition that the, that the potential of this kind of thing holds and we just need to sort of invest in, and move that needle forward, I think. Thank you, Alex. I don't know, Gary Mauritius, if you want to. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I, I, I agree, uh, which I think also came forward for my, my presentation. I think it's very important that this monitor, monitoring and evaluation part to really make sure that the impact is being made. Um, and yeah, like I said, I think um, uh, data can play a very important role uh, in that regard. Um, and I think also, uh, just to again um, uh, echo, I think it's also very important in all these cases that we also don't forget to focus really on the problem, really understand what's going on, and then go to the solution and, well, like I showed, um, investigate different ways of doing so, and then monitor. I think the whole step going from the beginning to the end, uh, that is very important, and that is, can really help us to, uh, to also in, in, improve investments. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Mauritius. Um, Gary, I don't know if you want to. Sure, sure, I'll jump in. Um, I agree on the on the monitoring piece. I think um, I'll only add on that that I think there's a good opportunity to combine public data, um, such as from space agencies, with um, you know startups and companies like um, P2 Impact and others that are out there um, who are really working to then take that that those data and turn them into something that um, is is applicable and, and you can communicate. Because I think there's there's something about monitoring evaluation and collecting the data, but then being able to translate that into um, more transparency and um, informing um, the, the, the stakeholders that who are being impacted by these projects. The other thing I'll, I'll touch on really quickly is at during Todd's talk, he talked about that there's, he thinks, and, and I tend to agree that there is plenty of financing sort of out there for these kinds of projects, but what um, they're looking for is more good projects. And so I think um, you know we talked about some of the barriers that 
are in place. And I would say uh, sort of on the on the less technical side, or I guess it includes technical side, is, is sort of the project development and creating good projects and um, building capacity and knowledge around how to create those projects that are, um, that are um, you know, enticing or, or speak to those, those um, financers. And so I think um, one thing that we're doing is we launched a nature for water facility, which is aimed at doing that, aimed at providing the, both the technical support and sort of that project um, process development on how to create nature-based solution for, um, for uh, water um, investable projects. And I think that that's a really important um, piece of the puzzle as well. So I just wanted to speak to that point. Thank you, Kari. Uh, we are getting a lot of questions uh, through Patawol. Thank you so much. Uh, we encourage the panelists to to answer them and to engage with the audience through Patawol. And now, Ana. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Con, como todo lo que empieza tiene que terminar, estamos llegando a la parte final de esta sesión. Para lo que quiero pedirle a Lorena Guillelaris, directora de Fundación FEMSA, que nos comparta algunas reflexiones, por favor. Gracias, Ana. Pues yo tuve una parte padrísima que disfruté muchísimo eh, y los que están cerca podrán ver todas las notas que tomé. Fue para mí una masterclass esta sesión y comenzó con un mensaje de esperanza de parte de Thor. Eh, hemos comenzado con la premisa de que la naturaleza tiene un valor fundamental eh, para todos nosotros y que vamos en la dirección correcta. Creo que hay muchas reflexiones en el camino que iré mencionando y que Resalto eh, cómo necesitamos movernos de la, de la filantropía tradicional y de los dólares tradicionales para canalizarlos a las soluciones basadas en la naturaleza y explorar de una manera más comprometida lo que, las oportunidades que trae Blender Financing para el mundo en el que estamos trabajando en materia de agua. Es muy importante probar los casos para que podamos moverlos hacia la escala. María Julia hablaba de manera muy importante de cómo hace una falta... Eh, la falta de datos y eh, conciliarla con la valoración del mercado, así como trabajar en arreglos institucionales para ir avanzando hacia adelante. Eh, José Antonio nos hablaba eh, y enfatizaba la colaboración y la coordinación, así como lo, el rol tan importante que tiene el liderazgo y la falta de liderazgos que hay que reconocer en nuestra región y que todos aquí, si estamos aquí es porque nosotros somos parte de los que creemos que eh, hay grandes oportunidades para llevarlo hacia adelante. De la misma manera, eh, el trabajo a, con una visión de largo plazo es fundamental, lo enfatizaba José Antonio, y cómo eh, tenemos que continuar trabajando en el monitoreo y la evaluación. Eh, Carmen hablaba de una parte que es también fundamental, cómo nos conectamos con las comunidades en las que estamos trabajando, y los llevamos para que este community engagement sea en el largo plazo y sea sostenible, desarrollando roles y responsabilidades y compromisos hacia adentro de las comunidades. Como también en este community engagement consideramos con un rol más prioritario a las ONGs eh, por el conocimiento que tienen hacia adentro y nos movemos a cuantificar los beneficios y los co-beneficios de las soluciones en las que estamos eh, trabajando. Eh, de ahí nos movimos a un segundo panel eh, que también estuvo sumamente interesante donde se planteó eh, cómo la tecnología ayuda a cuantificar y a medir los impactos de una manera mucho más costo efectiva y eh, Cari de, de, de Nature Conservancy nos eh, a, compartía cómo las plataformas de evaluación financiera son una guía muy clara y ya se tienen herramientas eh, sumamente eh, avanzadas para evaluar eh, estas soluciones. Así como eh, Maurits nos habló de eh, cómo la tecnología satelital y espacial nos ayuda a tomar decisiones, a impulsar intervenciones, pero también, y lo hemos visto nosotros desde las intervenciones que hemos hecho en conjunto con Fundación FEMSA, cómo nos está ayudando a mover a los policy makers a tomar mejores decisiones o a enfatizar que las decisiones que están tomando no van en la dirección correcta. Eh, eh, desde EU más vimos que son claros los beneficios de los esquemas de modelación que nos permiten hacer planes a largo plazo y Alex hablaba de lo importante que es crear un common truth eh, con esquemas de modelación eh, y eh, de ahí Laura Ballester, nuestra querida Laura, con quien también tenemos un, un trabajo de colaboración muy importante, resaltó lo importante que es nombrar las cosas 
con su nombre. Y creo que cuando estamos en un momento de emergencia, el ejemplo de cómo Monterrey ha elevado el, 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 a, un, a un grado de emergencia climática la situación en la que estamos, eh, creo que a quienes nos está tocando vivir la sequía de Monterrey nos hubiera encantado que esto sucediera 10 años atrás, como lo hizo quizás Sudáfrica, ¿no? Pero creo que también en nuestra región estamos avanzando en, en, en esta acción importante, nombrar las cosas por su nombre y sobre todo de llamar a la acción colaborativa eh, y a preservar el ecosistema eh, de agua en una eh, manera más resiliente eh, y cómo pues, la incidencia pública y, y la transformación que se logra desde este sector es fundamental. Eh, nos queda clarísimo a todos nosotros que las soluciones basadas en la naturaleza son el camino para seguir eh, construyendo un futuro con agua. La gran pregunta es si vamos a la velocidad adecuada. Creo que al regresar a casa vale la pena que sigamos con esta reflexión de hasta dónde podemos meterle el acelerador en las acciones que estamos haciendo. Hasta dónde estamos dispuestos a invertir más. ¿No? Esta palabra esto que, 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 se, que se ha escuchado muy desde el rol filantrópico, amar hasta que duela. Si amamos a nuestro planeta, tenemos que poner nuestro dinero donde está nuestro propósito. Y hoy el planeta nos está expresando de múltiples maneras que tenemos que invertir de manera más comprometida. No solamente donde logramos el retorno que en el sistema que sigue perpetuando la pobreza y la inequidad eh, se le satisface. Eh, estamos ob obligados a repensar las cosas. Eh, Estamos obligados también a impulsar más el mundo de impacto partiendo de esta premisa de que la confianza viene antes del amor y para construir confianza se construye a través de la autenticidad de relaciones que son genuinas, de esta solidez que hay en saber que te respalda el otro y tú respaldas al otro y los datos pues son el camino más visible para construir esa confianza. Esta es la motivación que nos ha motivado, eh, que nos ha inspirado en Fundación FEMSA a trabajar eh, en soluciones basadas en la naturaleza, en nuestros modelos de colaboración multisectorial. Nos sentimos muy orgullosos de colaborar con cada uno de los panelistas en diferentes proyectos. Muchísimas gracias a nuestros amigos del BID, con quienes tenemos una historia de 13 años de trabajo conjunto, a WRI. ATNC por organizar y coorganizar este, este foro compartido. Gracias a todos ustedes porque con su presencia estamos juntos amplificando la voz para América Latina. Gracias y buenas tardes. Que lo tenía aquí en mi nota. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Vito. Happy birthday to you. <laughs>